You are listening to Keystone Stock Talk Show, episode 199. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook and keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com for our Your Stock Our Take segment. And we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. We are happy to be back with you again this week to announce the launch of our 2023 first half live webinars on March 7th and 9th. We will start the show by talking about some hot button issues, including retail giants, Walmart and Home Depot forecasting a consumer slowdown. And we'll touch on Netflix's password crackdown that has hurt mainly Brandon. In our Your Stock, Our Take segment, Aaron answers a listener question on Digital Ocean Holdings, Inc., symbol D-O-C-N, on the New York Stock Exchange, a cloud computing solutions provider for startups and small to medium-sized businesses. The shares are down 74% since their peak. Aaron answers whether or not this is a this high-growth business is now finally trading at reasonable prices. Second in our Your Stock, Our Take segment, Brennan answers a question from a listener on Spin Master Corp, symbol T-O-Y or toy on the TSX. It's a children's entertainment company that creates, designs, manufactures, licenses, and markets various toys, entertainment franchises, and digital games in North America, Europe, and internationally. Spin Master is a great Canadian success story, has grown into a world-renowned toy company that has shown strong fundamental long-term growth in both revenue and EPS. But is it a good investment? Brennan lets you know. Finally, Brett answers a listener question on Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, symbol GBTC on the OTC in the US. It is solely and passively invested in Bitcoin, enabling investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin in the form of a security while avoiding the challenges of buying, storing, and safekeeping Bitcoin directly. The listener noticed that it trades at a significant discount to what he says is the value of the Bitcoin it owns and asked if this was an opportunity to invest in Grayscale itself. Brett, Brett, Brett will answer that. All right, let's get to the show. Uh, I wanted to start off. I'm going to welcome my co-host, Aaron, and the Killer Bees, Brett and Brennan. How are you guys doing? Yeah, Doing well. Doing well. Yep. As long as you don't call uh, Brett Brennan and Brennan Brett. <laughs> well, that, that happened at a point. recent conference, right? This that is you true. You guys were both Brett on your name tags. Yeah, I like, had a name or, tag. Or they that both was... Brennan. They're both, both Brett. Brett. They were both, both Brett. Brett. Okay. Yep. It's funny yeah. because Brennan sent in the names, so and somehow they still ended up. <laughs> and they were I correct when I sent them it. in. No, it was yeah. just, I thought yeah. it's hilarious. I wish that Brennan was actually Jenny. Then that would. Have been <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have rocked that. Uh, well. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, we're we're launching the. Uh, I want. We wanted to announce the launch of our upcoming webinars uh, on. March 7th and March 9th are our live DIY stock investing webinars. They're called A Better Way to Build a Stock Portfolio in 2023. We'll talk about how to add great dividend and dividend growth stocks to your portfolio, as well as uh, just growth oriented stocks from Canada and the US. Um, we, we say who should attend? Well, I'd say individuals or families who want further information on this, simply how to build a 15 to 25 stock portfolio. Uh, what you're going to get is eight profitable stocks from our coverage you can buy today. We're going to talk about the 2022 in review and 2023, the start to the year. Is it a dead cat bounce or is there something sustainable in the rally we're seeing right now? We'll talk about how big, point, big bank are killing your returns and give you eight simple steps to uh, fix and build a high quality portfolio. Talk about tech giants, the drop there. Uh, index down in the NASDAQ down in 2023 around 33%. And we're going to talk about is AI and chat GP set to power tech to new highs? Or, and we'll talk about the future of energy investing, oil and gas versus renewable, solar, wind, 
nuclear EVs and battery tech, the case for investing in each and some names you can look at there. So that will be that segment. We also have on March 12th, um, if you want the full complete package, the complete VIP stock portfolio building package, 25 stocks reviewed in a VIP portfolio, uh, you can look at that too. All the information on that, go to www.keystocks.com, click on that, get your tickets. The early bird tickets are there for sale now. The event does sell out all the time. I, we have not had an event that doesn't sold out, so I encourage you to get your tickets as soon as possible. Um, you guys want to comment on that? Aaron, you excited? You pumped? You gonna, I'm always, you I'm always pumped. At the event? Yeah. So I, mean, I just you said are. one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at what's been going on in the AI space because there's a lot of news in that area. So just talk about how AI is impacting the tech sector, some of the opportunities, um, what companies are actually making money from this, and but then also you know how to avoid speculative um, companies because there are going to be a lot of companies, there are, and there are going to be more companies that are flying under the banner of AI um, and some of these powerful technologies like ChatGPT but they're never going to make any money. They're never going to do anything but raise money from investors and spend it. They're never going to add value. So we want you to avoid those types of companies. We want to steer you to the companies that are actually making money in the space, meaning revenue and profitability. So that's exciting. And then just, you know, tying it all together into you building that 20, 20 to 25 stock portfolio, right? Um, one of the things we, we always advocate is building a portfolio that has a mix of different types of companies. I don't mean blindly diversifying in every sector. I mean, you know, some staple, stable businesses, dividend growth stocks, um, but then mixed with some more exciting themes as well, like um, technology, AI, and some other areas too. So that's what we're going to be discussing. It's going to be a great event. Yeah, we definitely look forward to it. And can we both already agree that uh, my prediction for the AI prediction this year is already coming true and I've already got a win in that category? Uh, you you got uh, 10 months to go, so... I can't yeah, even remember what it was. Year, so. What was the prediction? Oh, just that the, the AI theme would be a big theme in investing this year. And, and then there would, to, to you know tag on to that, there will be more and more companies like on the venture exchange, the OTC in the US that will take advantage of that, start raising capital. And yeah, and that and that's always the thing, right? And like one of the, th so the big, a big theme, well, it's, it's thing not even watch a theme, for. it's just a big yeah, a transition it, with respect to AI is something called generative AI. So that's the chat GPT, some of these text to image models. Um, but the fact that it now has a name means that it's gonna be, you know, the highly promotional entities are going to jump onto that and they're going to, they're going to call themselves um, um, generative AI companies just in order to essentially raise money. And they're going to be some, a lot of legitimate businesses too, but unfortunately I think they're going to be more companies that lose money. Than it's it's money. funny. I, I we're doing a sweep of the U S markets uh, kind of 2 billion and under looking at companies right now, all four of us are looking and, uh, I went through a couple hundred companies uh, a couple days ago on the OTC QX, the higher end of the OTC market. And I did pull out three names that had already had AI, you know, yeah. and chat GPT yeah. in there in in their tagline. Funny that <laughs> oh, one really? of the companies also had EV, cannabis, and several oh, other. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Well, want cannabis those, we should almost review the company just because there's so many things that it's doing that are hot button topics right now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we've, we've seen said some. in the past, it seems to be, it's not a scientific thing, but it seems to be that the more descriptive a company's name is, the less likely it is to be a, a legitimate company, right? So if, yeah. if the company has AI or chat GPT in the name or, or you know, something that's mm -hmm. extremely specific, like, um, you know, AI acquisition growth corp, it's probably, it's probably not a company you want to invest in. Most companies yeah. just, I don't know, by coincidence or design, I don't know. They go on to do good things, um, have more abstract names, um, I guess, because they're yeah. not specifically trying to jump on the bandwagon of, of that industry. It just it just seems to work out like that. I always thought Apple was an orchard so for the longest <laughs> time. You know what I'm saying? So that's why. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, we see that. And, 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 and we also do they, they have the products that built the brand, right? They didn't need yeah. to, <laughs> say, innovative computer growth corp or something. <laughs> We, we also wanted to say last week we launched the uh, our uh, Keystones, or we released, sorry, our Keystones 2023 Cash Rich Profitable Small Cap Special Report. It's, uh, 
it takes about three months to put that report together, go through around 3,500 companies in Canada. There's 62 stocks that were pulled out that meet the criteria of cash rich, uh, small to mid cap companies uh, in Canada. And uh, they're profitable from operations, strong balance sheets. And, and then we looked, you know, there's a, about 30 reports plus in there on individual companies in that range. And we pulled out some buys from our coverage as well. And there's a special section that has about 13 micro to nano caps with market values of under 50 million that uh, meet our criteria, essentially um, not our full criteria, but meet, meet some levels of our criteria, have a good balance sheet, ha are cash rich and are profitable. And uh, some of our clients uh, like to invest in those type of individual securities. So we've noted about 13 in there that we're monitoring. Uh, for potential entry points. Some of them are far less liquid than we'd be comfortable uh, recommending to our mm -hmm. full client base, but there are some in there that clients could look at if they have a taste for those type of more speculative type of events. That was also one of they your- They are all uh, profitable. Yeah. That was also one of your 2023 predictions, right? That we were going to see a few of those cash-rich companies get bought out. Is that correct? I mean, not yes, specifically. So we'll, we'll, but, uh, yeah, we'll see if that you know, happens over the course of this year, but I do, yeah, yeah I would predict we're that because we've it. had some significant declines there. You yep. better hold me to it. Yep. You should. I believe it will happen over the course of this year. So you want, want to get into the full show now? We The first one of the hot button kind of topics that we saw over the course of this week was a uh, consumer slowdown kind of hinted at by Walmart and Home Depot. Uh, we have been monitoring economic conditions broadly, given the fact that uh, the NASDAQ, again, was down around 33% in 2022. But it started 2023 with a bang up over 13%, almost 14% at one point. And our question that we're mulling over is whether or not the market move is sustainable or this is just you're throwing it, you know, it's your dead cat bounce. Uh, one tool that you can look at, now this is by no means scientific, but it gives you a broader idea of where the outlook of some of the top CEOs from the largest retailers. You look at some of the outlooks from the largest retailers are including the likes of Walmart and Home Depot. This week, Walmart came out with uh, expectations for the year as did Home Depot with their quarterly numbers. Uh, Walmart easily topped expectations for their holiday quarter, but it gave a weaker than expected outlook for the year ahead. Home Depot for its part issued kind of similar guidance, the home improvement retailer, which also reported its fourth quarter fiscal results this week, said it planned for flat same store sales uh, going forward over the course of this year. As stubborn inflation and climbing interest rates caused consumers to watch their spending. Uh, to quote the Home Depot chief financial officer, he said, we've seen an increasing degree of price sensitivity as the year has gone on which is actually sort of what we've predicted in the face of persistent inflation. I mean, that would be something that seems very logical and that happened over the course of, and particularly into the fourth quarter of 2022. And now they're seeing that going into 2023. Uh, again, the significant price increases of everyday goods, including food, uh, this coupled with higher mortgage payments at present or on the horizon should lead to weaker, a weaker consumer particularly on discretionary items. This is not great for economic growth near term and can hit the stock market. However, one could argue on the flip side, that de the declines in 2022, with the hit we saw in the markets there, that, had our, that, that hit has already come in the markets. The markets have already anticipated that and taken the, mar the, the valuations lower. But if you look at current valuations, they are still not on the historically high end. They are on the historically high end. So caution for us would remain. Um, I would say discretionary or discretionary retailers uh, are likely in a tougher position than say the Walmarts and Home Depots of the world. So like Macy's and Nordstrom in the US public companies um, that are skewed towards discretionary goods, apparel, handbags, shoes, and those things. Those two companies have already warned about their holiday results. So that would be their Q4 results for those companies. In the cases of Walmart and Home Depot, they both sell consumer staples largely, particularly Walmart, so they should fare better in a recession. What I worry about on these companies generally is the fact that in terms of Walmart and Home Depot, they still trade at premium multiples. Walmart is still 24 times forward earnings, 
and Home Depot is 18.2 times forward EPS with earnings expected to be lower this year. So no growth, actually lower earnings this year. So, I mean, those would be my thoughts on the, the news that came out from Home Depot and uh, Walmart this year, you got, or just this week. You guys got any comments on that? Well, Walmart certainly is going to be a good barometer for the overall economy. Um, and I, I don't think it's much of a surprise. Most people are expecting that we're going to go into some kind of a recession. The really, really, the question is, how long is recession going to last? Is it going to be short and shallow or long and deep? Um, and that's really what, what matters right now. I'd say the market seems to be expecting what would be referred to as a soft landing, so that short and shallow recession. Um, but I've noticed a lot, I mean, just from reading the conference calls of, of various industries, I mean, we're definitely noticing slowdown for sure. Like in the tech space, for example, um, several tech, tech companies that we cover have, have, you know, companies that have been able to produce consistent double digit above 20% growth year over year over year are saying that, you know, their customers are starting to pull back on spending right now. Um, they're seeing lower levels of growth, most still growing, some, you know, generating or expecting more flat performance, but definitely that um, customers, so companies are starting to really look at their budgets and being more careful about how much they spend. Um, there's commentary from some of the tech players that have the biggest challenge they've had over previous years has been hiring tech talent. It's been really hard to hire people and wages have been going up. Now they're slowing down hiring. Um, you know, another sector as well that we're looking at, we've, we've followed for years and, and have made recommendations in, in the past would be trucking. Um, so there is, you know, over the past couple of years, shortage of drivers, a lot of upward pressure on prices. Um, so trucking companies have benefited from that, but now we're seeing the reverse. Um, there's some downward pressure on prices. So we're definitely seeing this reverberate through the, the economy. Not a surprise. I mean, I, I would be shocked if we don't go into recession. The question is, you know, how long is it going to last? So right now it seems that inflation is trending in the right direction. And if it continues to do that, you know, maybe six to nine months, the Bank of Canada and, and the Fed in the U.S. starts to talk about lowering interest rates. If that happens, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, or, or we get a couple um, interest rate declines, then, you know, we might start to see um, some adrenaline get pumped back into the market. Now, a lot of these companies are thinking, you know, for example, in the tech space, that things are going to recover in the latter half of 2023 or in early 2024. But really, that's just speculation at this point. I mean, nobody knows. Um, but what they are saying over the next couple quarters is they're definitely seeing, you know, a big slowdown in growth, tightening of budgets. And, um, and that's going to, that's going to affect the, the bottom line. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's something we have to monitor closely and it's really, it's to the extent, like you said, but, but I'll just add though, I don't think that this affects or should affect or impact investment decisions really, because the, the fact of the matter is you can't predict what's going to happen with the macro economy, even if it's trending in a certain direction right now. Um, there are so many moving parts to that equation. It's really to, to predict where the economy is going to go in the next one or two years is that that's a fool's game. You're not going to win that game at all. I don't believe anybody does long term. So really what you want is you want to invest in good, solid businesses that you want to own for five years plus um, and that you're buying at a reasonable price companies that are, are essential companies that are solving important problems. Those are the types of businesses that the world is going to need, regardless of what happens. They may see lower growth, even a decline. In revenue and cash flow in the near term but those are the businesses that are going to come out of any recession even stronger and if we do have a soft landing then the impact to a lot of these companies may not be they may be quite muted yeah and that is because forecasts are for idiots really and like really we yeah. could be talking which is about why we made a bunch of forecasts at the beginning of the year <laughs> which is why well, we also admit it that, they, that nobody should they're for idiots yeah and basically or they should not inform any investment decisions yeah, what is it? A good true, right? a good forecaster makes a lot of forecasts because, like, you know, you yeah. just throw in. You make it. You make as many forecasts <laughs> yeah. as possible, so that by the probabilities, one or two of those are going to be yeah. correct, and then you just talk about the ones that are correct, <laughs> or you predict something for long enough that eventually it comes true. Um, like you know, a yeah, certain I happen I happen to see a presentation, price. yeah, and then you start talking about how you've been, you know, a long term bull. 
and that area. Yeah. We see it all the time. Don't listen to forecasters. I saw a presentation recently where there was bullish on these things, bearish on that on the same slide. And it was bullish on about, you know, 15 to 20 things, bearish on about 15 to 20 things. And I, I could almost guarantee the speech next year will be all come back. And I'll highlight the three that I was right on each side and look how, look how much of a hero I am. Um, you know, for us, that's not the way to be doing it. And it also doesn't predict, predict or pre it doesn't prove that you can predict anything. Yeah, I mean, what right, you let's want get from the forecast is to judge it is could you actually have used the entire forecast mm -hmm. to generate a solid investment return in excess of just, you know, investing in the index or whatnot? Um, that's mm -hmm. the real test, right? So there's a lot of people that have made forecasts. Sometimes they're correct, but they were not investable. Sometimes they were not correct and also not investable. So yeah, there, there's many there's many forecasts that are with the consensus that aren't. You're not going to make a profit off them anyways because the market is the consensus. The market is already using the consensus. All the investments that are made are on the consensus. So it, you know, or you could say why. something is going to happen. So stay away from it, but you could say, you know, advise to get into something else. And that also doesn't work out. Right. So net, net, the person is still not benefited from using the forecast. Now you said net a segue that is to Netflix. There is a, uh, a uh -oh. poor segue, but a segue nonetheless, <laughs> uh, Netflix starts cracking down on passwords sharing in four countries. This happened at this uh, near, uh, the start of this month. Uh, those countries, I believe, Canada, New Zealand, Portugal, and Spain. Obviously, we're in Canada, so we're feeling that right now. Uh, Brennan and Brett are losing it. Brett, did you want to kind of detail that, or was, is that all we need? And, and you guys wanted yeah. to get some comments out on that. Aaron, yeah, more, that more of a rant, I think, from most of us, because uh, yeah. it, it has affected us. And um, I, I think they had it running in a couple South American countries before these four, and this is their further rollout and they actually yeah. mistakenly mm -hmm. said initially that they were going to roll it out in the u.s and then they quickly pulled back oh oh no that, that's too big of a market for us to test in pretty much so I, I think they're using canada new zealand uh spain and portugal as test markets for their larger markets so u.s and uh i think germany and uh uk are pretty big for them as well i would assume um pretty much all of this is they're making it so you cannot have the same account in different households. But the issue is, which many people are having, is it doesn't matter if it's a different person. It could be you in, let's say, a second house. You're traveling a lot. They do have a bit of a workaround, but it only is seven days. And let's say you're using a smart TV, which is something which yeah. I've seen a couple complaints online, is that Netflix's solution is to bring, let's say, a 70-inch smart TV to your home address and move it back to the location once a week. Mm -hmm. That is their solution. Or you can pay them $8 a month for what you're previously getting. So they've lost a lot of goodwill quite quickly. Like, I, I can see their point. Like, don't share Netflix accounts with other people. That's, I don't think that's too controversial. No. Like, it, it does, it, there's a bit behind it because they've previously said it's fine. They actually promoted it in 2013. There's a tweet that's going around, one of their old tweets saying, you're, you're free to share passwords. And they weren't even just saying that. They were actually promoting it. Then in, I think, 2017, they were saying, yeah, we're still good with it. And now... Six years after that, they're completely pulling back on it. They've uh, increased prices like two times, two mm -hmm. X, I should say, during that time period as well. So it's really uh, led to a lot of people reevaluating their 20 some odd dollar Netflix subscription if they can't share it with other people. Yeah. So, like, I think Netflix yeah. came out and they were estimating that about 100 million households uh, were sharing passwords. And then, as well, in late um, 2022, um, there was a study that was published on Forbes, essentially from this uh, company called Attest, a consumer research platform. And essentially, they were saying that about 22.6% of people who you or uh, filled out this survey essentially said that they engage in password sharing. I personally use my parents' Netflix account, uh, <laughs> but um, they're coming after you. Netflix <laughs> is a subscriber of this podcast, Brennan. Yes, but you know what I will You're say dead. is I've spoken with a couple of my friends I hear sirens already and they said that they have had they've been prompted to select whether they were the primary household on their netflix account well that hasn't happened to me yet um and i asked my i got it 
You did get it? Well, I haven't got it yet. My mom was watching Netflix just the other day uh, in my hometown, and she hasn't got it yet. So did they miss out on me? I don't know. They but don't even know Saskatoon exists either. I, I guess yeah. not. But, um, you know, because... They think it's a made-up place. No, no, no. Well, they they love, just they love Saskatoon. No. Um, but, yeah, because the only reason, you know, I don't watch too much Netflix, as these guys know, I'm not a big movie buff or anything like that. But Netflix recently came out with Full Swing, which is like essentially they're following the PGA tour and the golfers on the PGA tour. And that released last week. Um, so, you know, I already binge watched the whole thing anyways. So, I mean, if all of a sudden they do ask if I'm the primary, I don't really have anything else to watch on Netflix. So whatever. <laughs> I would say that's a sentiment for a lot of people. That's what I mean with people reevaluating. And if they, they use it once or twice a month, they're, they're not seeing it where it's like the eight, nine bucks a month, it, what they're charging now. So mm-hmm. They're just going to drop off. So when they're saying there's 100 million households are sharing it, I think there's going to be a lot of first off crossover, with, like I was saying before, with multiple household people are going to work or whatever. But then there, a lot of them are just aren't going to switch to it. They're, they're only doing it because it's part of their family or friend's plan. They're not going to pay for it. Yeah. And if they'll just go to either piracy or they will just not watch anything. It's as simple as that. And I think Netflix has shot a lot of their goodwill in the foot at this point. And if they do end up needing to revert, which is why they're using Canada and other countries for test markets before they roll to the US, it's going to not bring up the people back who'd left. And it's a big issue. And they're really struggling on their content production as well. Their content, if you are a viewer, they've lost a lot of their third party content over the last decade as well. They're relying on their exclusives, which are sometimes good, but there's a lot of just ones which they'll count after one season, which is a common complaint as well. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, it's been building and there's this general, I would say, discontent with their service. So this is really uh, breaking the camel's back at this point, I would say. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see like what the fundamentals do and how much, you know, they actually kind of come out and say, uh, you know, people are like, or they're getting new subscribers from, you know, law or um, really batting down the hatches on this, uh, um, you know, password sharing. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, there's so much you know there's so many others out there disney plus i mean not that i have any yeah it'll be interesting to see whether some of them piggyback on this but i think Mm -hmm. everybody's they'll all do it i mean disney sitting back and waiting to see how disney allows people to share passwords right now and Mm -hmm. i mean that's very strategic right because they just want as many people to get used to using disney and once people are accustomed to using it and liking it you know eventually they're gonna they're gonna roll up roll that out as well I was just taking a look at Netflix's uh, Q4 results. So basically flat revenue year over year, um, big drop in earnings per share, you know, moderate drop in operating operating income. So they're they're at the stage of their growth right now. They've they've gone through their their um, high growth phase and now they're becoming a more mature business. So they're needing to find ways to to maximize the margin and, and maintain market share. And this is this is essentially what they're doing. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people will leave. Um, some people won't, you know. Yeah. I don't know who watches well, cable anymore, though. I mean, I was thinking about that the other day. I never watched just cable. Just sports. The last I mean, time I, I, yeah, I mean, the last time I turned on cable was probably a year ago. And I basically scrolled through the channels for two minutes. And I'm like, there's nothing on. And I went to Netflix or Disney. Do, do you still have a, a cable package? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Would you consider? Well, we need it at our house for various reasons Uh, because there's a Spanish language channel on it and we need that. So, yeah, I still have it and it's literally mainly for sports. I would not have it, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they just called me yesterday because I'm up for renewal. So I'm I'm battling them. Anyways, I don't want to get into it. Battle Royale. Fun times. It was good. Yeah, it was a good call. Um, Let's get to uh, another high growth company, Digital Ocean Holdings Inc. Symbol DOCN on the New York Stock Exchange. Aaron's going to take over. Mm-hmm. I, got, I believe you got some slides for us too. It's a slideshow, folks. I think I, do. I, think I do. for the people on um, Apple or, or podcast views. <laughs> um, you're not going to see this. You can see it on YouTube, but Aaron's going to really describe it so well that it's going to be like you're looking right at it, right, Aaron? I'm going to describe how you can go to YouTube and watch these slides. No, it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, we're going to walk through this. It'll be easy to follow. Y O U T U B E dot com. So, Digital Ocean Holdings Inc., the symbol is D O C N. It's a NASDAQ company. It's trading about $33 per share right now. 
and it's an over $3 billion market cap company. Uh, and what they do is they're a cloud computing platform provider, and they specialize in developer startups, small and medium-sized businesses. And they're a company that I'm familiar with. I've actually gone through many of their tutorials on their blog in the past. So it's I followed them. I was quite excited to see the results when they were out and wanted to you know evaluate how they were doing. Um, and one of the reasons why I was excited is because the stock price has come down a lot. Now, they just went public. It was in, um, I believe it was in May of 20, no, April of 2022. So they, they've not been public for, for very long. Um, but after going public, the, I mean, the, the stock price just, sorry, May of 2021, the stock price just absolutely went parabolic um, in the first months of going public. And like most companies, um, they they hit their peak. Most companies in the tech sector, they hit their peak. And around November, December of 2021, um, they gotten up to a price of close to $130 after IPOing at the, you know, say the $33 range or $40 range, sorry. Um, and then since then, it's just been straight down, down 74%. So trading now at about $33 um, below the initial IPO price. Now, they just put out their, their Q4 and year-end results. And if we look at the headline results, um, they look pretty good. In the fourth quarter, revenue of $162 million compared to $119 million last year. Uh, earnings per share of $0.28 cents compared to $0.11 cents last year. So great growth in, uh, in revenue and earnings there. And then for the full year, revenue growing to $576 million from four twenty eight, dollars And earnings per share growing... Um, to 94 cents from 37 cents. So well over a double there in, in earnings per share. However, um, these are non-GAAP earnings per share. So these are adjusted. These The company non-GAAP means that they, they, do, they do not conform to GAAP accounting rules. The company makes whatever adjustments they deem to make to make their, their um, earnings more comparable. So if we look at the GAAP, the, the accounting compliant, Figures we can see that there's there's a big difference here. So, just for example, for the year, um, non-GAAP income from operations of 102 million, non-GAAP. But if we go to GAAP, it's actually a loss of 26 million. So, based on GAAP earnings, the company is not profitable. Um, negative 10 cents for the quarter compared to negative 11 cents in the same quarter last year. Uh, and, net loss of 24 cents per share for the year compared to a net loss of 21 cents in the year before. And this is this is an issue that we've been talking about in the in the tech sector a lot lately is the the massive difference between a company's non-gap earnings and their gap earnings and it's not necessarily that making adjustments to your earnings is a bad thing. Sometimes you need to make adjustments. Um, there are a lot of things that um, can distort accounting earnings and make those earnings not be good representations of the economic value generated in the period, right? So some adjustments are fine, but it's it's when you see such a major difference between an adjusted earnings figure and a non-adjusted earnings figure, you really have to make some investigation into that. So what we would do is we would go to the reconciliation, um, which essentially tells you how the company gets from their gap to their non-gap figures. Um, to figure out what is coming out of this. So for the year, as always, what we always see with these technology software companies is stock-based compensation is a major factor. So they paid $105 million in stock-based compensation last year. Um, that was the biggest adjustment, right? So when you add that on to the, the $24 million gap-based net loss, that's how they get to a, a non-GAAP profitability. And there's a few other things in there too. There's some acquisition related expenses. There is an impairment. There was some amortization of intangible assets. But really, it's that stock-based compensation that we're seeing as being the primary difference for almost all software companies um, when you're looking at GAAP earnings relative to non-GAAP earnings. And this is, this is a topic that is debated a lot. I mean, Warren Buffett says, you know, you have to consider stock-based compensation to be an expense like any other. Some people are like, no, just take it out of there, ignore it. Um, we like to look at both figures. You know, it's, it's, there is a cost to 
issuing shares to your employees. Now, it's interesting to see how a lot of this is going to play out because stock-based compensation has always been a major, um, a major tool, so to speak, for technology companies to, um, to pay their employees, right? And a lot of employees would take stock in lieu of cash salaries because the, the share prices of these software companies have been increasing so much. Um, but now we're in a situation where most software companies have declined in price quite significantly. So getting shares is not as attractive as it once was. How is this going to play out? I don't know. But whenever there's a major difference between non-GAAP and GAAP earnings for, or uh, adjusted earnings and unadjusted earnings, you really have to be careful, especially when a company looks very profitable on an adjusted basis, but is losing a lot of money on a non-adjusted basis. You really have to consider both figures and not just blindly take the adjusted numbers as many investors and analysts do, okay? So anyways, um, great earnings, great growth on an adjusted basis, not making money on an unadjusted basis, but they do generate cash flow, fairly solid cash flow. Uh, the balance sheet, so taking a look at the balance sheet. Um, Cash and equivalents, 140 million. Marketable securities, 723 million. So what are we at here? About 863, 864 in cash. Um, but this company does have debt. DigitalOcean does have some debt. 1.5 billion in long-term debt, another 108 million in operating uh, lease liabilities. We consider that debt as well. And not much shareholders equity. So 51 million in shareholders equity. Now, we don't typically look at the shareholders equity too much when we're evaluating a company. This is really an accounting figure. Uh, but at the same time, when a company has negative equity or very little equity, it's not ideal situation. So what does this mean? Well, that's another topic of debate. We would like to see a good, um, uh, you know, a fair amount of shareholders equity. In this case, it's 51 million, um, well below the net debt the net debt being $714 million on this company. So financial outlook, uh, they're looking for good growth in 2023, total revenue, 700 to 720 million and earnings per share, non-GAAP, $1.65 to $1.69. So the, the guidance looks great at face value. While a lot of technology companies are saying growth is gonna slow substantially, um, you know, maybe it even flatlines, maybe we even have slightly lower revenues. DigitalOcean is saying that they're going to continue to grow at a very strong rate. So what does all this look like in summary? Well, revenue growth based on the guidance would be about 23%. So they're looking at growing the revenue about 23% this year. Very impressive revenue growth, particularly in a market where, as I said, a lot of companies aren't expecting as much growth. Um, Non-GAAP earnings per share growth, 78%. That's a fantastic growth rate if they're able to achieve it. Uh, and what this would be in terms of a price to earnings valuation for 2023 would be about 20 times, 20 times non-GAAP earnings per share. Now, if we're looking at GAAP, I don't know, maybe they produce another unprofitable year. Maybe they um, are you know, producing GAAP earnings closer to non-GAAP. We don't know at this point, but they're only giving guidance for non-GAAP. Um, so 20 times earnings, if we're just to take that at face value, I would say that's a very, very reasonable valuation for a company that's growing, expecting to grow revenue at 23% and earnings per share at almost 80%. However, as I said, we can't really just take that as face value, not completely. Um, cash flow, they did generate, I think about 77 million in free cash flow in 2022. That puts the valuation of 41 times free cash flow. Not super cheap. Not at all. Um, you know, given the growth rate, you know, maybe you could argue that it's reasonable long term, um, but it's certainly it's certainly a premium. And there are other companies that we see that have price to free cash flow ratios at that level or slightly below that we think are growing, you know, at equally impressive rate and, um, you know, maybe have better fundamentals in other areas. But one area that I really don't like about the company is when I look at that balance sheet. So if I were to take that net debt of 714 million, do a net debt to adjusted EBITDA multiple, we get the 3.6 net debt to adjusted EBITDA. And this is adjusted EBITDA. Again, 
if we were to just use regular EBITDA unadjusted, I, I we may not even be working with a positive value. I'm not 100% sure. But let's just assume we can just take the adjusted EBITDA at face value. Net debt to adjusted EBITDA 3.6 times, that's that's fairly leveraged, you know, particularly for a software company. You know, a lot of the software companies that we look at, like the Fordnets, the EPAMs, or the Microsofts, the Googles, they actually have net cash on their balance sheet. So it's not even a net debt. Their net debt to adjusted EBITDA is nothing because they have no net debt. They're dealing with net cash. So that's typically what we like to see in a lot of companies in the software space have that net cash balance. So I would consider this to be a fairly levered balance sheet for a software company, um, you know, approaching four times. I'm not super comfortable with that. And then the debt to equity 14 times, that's a huge ratio. That indicates high leverage. Again, we don't really use the, the shareholders equity value that much because it is such an accounting term, but still 14 times debt to equity. You know, I can't, uh, I can't say that that's, that's something that I'd like to see. And actually want to know what there there's, there's, that's actually net debt to equity, which it, it should actually be total debt to equity. So we would probably double that, I believe. Um, so it'd be like about 28 times. <laughs> So yeah, in summary, you want to know what I think DigitalOcean, it's, it's got a lot of interesting attributes to the business. As I said, I know it as a stock. I know it as a, um, as a follower of, of some of their tutorials. But I think that there's better companies to invest in. Um, you know, there are companies where there's not such a differential between the, the adjusted and the non-adjusted EPS. Companies in the software space that have, you know, really strong growth, maybe similar to this. Um, that are still gap profitable and that have much better balance sheets. So we'll continue to follow the company, but based on the fundamentals of what I'm seeing, I would say that we're not going to be in any hurry to invest. My biggest takeaway would be there's a huge gap between the gap and the non-gap earnings. And that's a lot of gap, but it actually is. Ha ha, funny as that is. I love I it. I know that's hilarious, but it, it is true that there is. And that is the crux of the argument really right here when we're talking about the company. I also read the company, they have a buyback program. Um, they, they actually bought back 600 million uh, worth of shares, I believe in 2022. But despite that buyback, there were still more shares outstanding at the end of 2022. Yeah. And, and buying back with what yeah. they, they've got, yes, they've well, got a ton of at some point. Right. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like if you're sitting there, if you're one of those net cash businesses, like say Ford. And, and is your share price is doing this too. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ford Net's company cybersecurity, like they've got net cash, right? They're buying yeah. back a lot of shares too. That I can yeah. understand. But if you already, but, if you have a ton of debt and you have a balance sheet that's already yeah. over levered, in my opinion, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should work on paying down the debt. And because, because of the share-based compensation, they still ended up with more shares at the end of the year. And they've authorized a $500 million buyback in 2023. Right. So let's let's look at that from like that share-based compensation perspective and like, well, is this actually a cost? Like the cost is they spent a bunch of money buying back shares and they still ended up with more shares. So mm -hmm. there is a cash cost, right? Yeah, if you're yeah, going to compare this, this, the capital saying, structures, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, and it, it's if you look at their guidance too, they have projecting more shares outstanding at the end of 2023 than at the start of the year. Mm -hmm. So you're buying back likely quite a bit of shares. You're still ending up with more shares. So it's there's your cash cost. Mm -hmm. You can see it. And I, I mean, yeah, it, it's, we're we're not saying this company is the worst company in the world, but um, you know, there's we're just uh, not if you were to compare it. Yeah, if you compare this company to like other companies that have actual earnings, right? And 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 there's some there's obviously debate as to whether the quality of this company's earnings, the non-gap earnings, but you can compare it to some that you can find trade, you know, that maybe are growing at 15 to 20 percent that are trading at 15 to 20 times earnings, mm -hmm. but it's actual gap earnings. Uh, maybe a different sector, right? But um, it's and likely not as leveraged, then you're weighing that against investing in this company, even though the company's shares are down 74%. So, and at one point they were, you know, start of the year. And that, that's another point that I wanted to make is like, when you look at that 20 times, 
uh, non-GAAP EPS multiple, price to earnings multiple. You know, I don't even consider it, you know, given all the other things we talked about, that to be especially cheap. But the company has grown its earnings and the share price has declined. So what was that multiple at the peak when it was trading close to $130? You know, three times, maybe four times that amount, possibly. Um, pro- yeah, I mean, certainly four times that amount, probably. Um, so some will th- say, well, you know, they've grown their earnings. The share price is down 75%. The value must be good. It's actually not. You're now just getting to a point where you can be like, okay, the value is starting to get into that range where it's not completely ridiculous, where it's starting to get reasonable again. You're not. And this is what we've seen with a lot of those software yeah. companies. And based on non-GAAP, what you're too. What's yeah. that? And based on non-GAAP, it's starting and that's, to be And that's easy. also just taking that's the non-GAAP just, yeah. and not, you know, yeah. which which we don't want to do. So I don't know. Yeah. And based on the free cash flow, you know, it was just, it was still kind of expensive. It's given still a kind of expensive. Right? Growth rate. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, if it's That's growing a good their cash flow at eighty percent every year, then no. But yeah, there's, you know, but the risk. It's difficult for any company, yeah. even the greatest, to do that. So, yeah. all right, let's look at another company, uh, Spin Master Symbol Toy T O Y on the T S X venture uh, or T S X. Uh, uh, Brennan, because you like that. to play with their stuff. Whenever I know. hear that name, I think of Brennan at the DJ table spinning records. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, anyways. Or trying to solve a, a Rubik's Cube, right, Brennan? Yeah, I can't do that. There's not a chance. I mean, I'm they, sure I They do own out, the Rubik's brand. This is true. Spin Master owns the Rubik's brand. This is true. Um, so, yes, we did get a question from Brian via email on Spin Master. Uh, so, it is Spin Master Corp, T O Y, on the TSX, currently trading at a price of about $37.35 has a 0.7% dividend yield and a market cap of about 3.8 billion. So Spin Master is a child's entertainment company that creates, designs, manufactures, licenses, and markets uh, various toys, entertainment franchises, and digital games in North America, Europe, and internationally. Its product categories include activities, games and puzzles, plush toys, and action toys. And the company offers its products under popular names, including Paw Patrol, Brett's favorite, uh, Kinetic Sand, Air Hogs, Hatchimals, Rubik's Cube, uh, Etch-A-Sketch, and Orbeez brands, as well as many others. And it also produces television video on demand, subscription video on demand, and movies. So moving to slide two here, just looking at some operational updates. So Spin Master will release the sequel of Paw Patrol, uh, the Mighty Movie, on October 13th, 2023. It actually ended up Um, The first movie that they released was in 2021, and it added, I believe it was about $25 million uh, in revenue to the business. Um, In July, the company's board of directors authorized and declared the company's first quarterly dividend of $0.06 per share. And again, this is the first time that it ever paid a quarterly dividend as a public company. So that's nice to see that they are using their cash balance because they are a cash-rich company, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, And in the summer of 2022, Uh, Spin Master entered into a global licensing agreement with Sony Interactive Entertainment, uh, where they will be the global master toy licensee for the PlayStation brand, uh, including God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, The Last of Us, which actually was just released as a, a TV show, which is very popular among people right now, and as well as Uncharted. Uh, And essentially, they're going to develop toys uh, relating to these lines. And this toy line is anticipated to launch in the spring of 2024. And on February 28th of 2022, Spin Master announced that it renewed its global licensing agreement with Warner Bros. uh, and DC for the iconic Batman franchise uh, and other DC superheroes. And this licensing agreement is for a four-year term beginning in 2023 through to 2026. And the company has been growing both organically as well as through acquisitions. They've made, they've made about 28 acquisitions since its IPO in 2015, uh, with the most recent being on January 10th of this year, uh, where they acquired the Hexbug brand of toys. Um, and the company also last year, late last year, announced the acquisition of Canadian-based 4D Brands International which essentially creates a uh, puzzle model construction. And they do have um, some franchisees such as uh, Star Wars, 
uh, Disney, Harry Potter, Marvel Universe, DC Comics, and more. Now, looking at the actual financial results, so I do just have the last eight quarters up here. Um, but looking at the most recent quarter, Q3 of 2022, revenue was about 624 million, which was a decrease of about 12.7% from uh, 714.5 million for the previous year. And this decrease was driven by reduced shipments in Q3 2022 compared to the prior year as a result of customers ordering early earlier in the current year, as well as entertainment revenue was down uh, due to lower distribution revenue related to the Paw Patrol movie, uh, like I kind of was mentioning earlier, and the digital games revenue decreased due to lower in-app purchases in Toka Life World. Looking at the profitability, so Q3 2022 adjusted EBITDA was 167.6 million, uh, a decrease of about 23% from the previous year. And net income for Q3 2022 was 141.4 million, an increase of 4.4%. But if we actually look at the adjusted earnings, uh, this actually was down uh, slightly. Um, and looking at the company's balance sheet, we did actually include this company in our cash rich reports because they are a cash rich business uh, with about 674.9 million in cash and debt and leases of only 71 million, providing a net cash position of 603.9 million or $5.87 per share. And looking at the trailing valuation multiples, it trades with a trailing PE of about 9.4 times and an EV or enterprise value to adjusted EBITDA of about five times, which you know appears, appears attractive if the company can continue to grow. So the company did recently come out with uh, a decrease in their fiscal 2022 guidance, where management now expects 2022 toy gross product sales in constant currency to increase by low single digits compared to 2021 as compared to low double digits announced on July 27th, 2022. So they are bringing that guidance down and management now expects 2022 adjusted EBITDA margin to be slightly below the 2021 adjusted EBITDA margins as previous guidance announced that it would essentially be in line with uh, the 2021 margins. So to conclude here, Spin Master is a world-renowned toy company that has shown strong long-term fundamental performance in growing both its revenue and EPS, increasing its revenue through organic and inorganic means at a compound annual growth rate of about 19% uh, from $417.7 million in fiscal 2012 to about $2 billion in fiscal 2021. Now, looking forward for growth, the company is expected to release the sequel of Paw Patrol in late 2023, and a PlayStation line of toys expected to launch in the spring of 2024. But considering management's lowering of guidance, the near-term growth outlook is a little difficult to determine. Now, the company does maintain a cash-rich balance sheet and recently started paying a six-cent quarterly dividend, but the company continues to be only as good as its next best toy, an investment thesis would be dependent on management continuing to execute on growth moving forward, which to me personally seems a little unclear, even though they do have some interesting things in the pipeline. Yeah, I think Spin Master is, an, is a really interesting company. You go back to 2012, they had about $460 million and up to $3 billion, you know, in, in 2022, I believe, or the trailing 12 months. So yeah. tremendous growth, operating earnings up over that period too. I think in this situation, uh, you have to you'd have to trust management that they continue to innovate, come up with great products, or make acquisitions from the cash flow in hand. If you had a great deal of trust with them, you know it's trading at a relatively reasonable valuation. If you take cash out, um, particularly even with cash in, um, it's just now the prediction is for lower EPS this year potentially, right? Lower so. You know, if they get a hit off a toy this year, maybe, you know, and have some recurring type of revenues from past products like they own, say, Rubik's Cube. I'm sure there's a certain amount that get purchased every year. Every new household needs a Rubik's Cube or something like that. But, you know, I, it, they do have to keep hitting. I mean, they have a track record of doing it. Yep. Uh, the other factor here would be in a recessionary time, they you know, maybe you buy a few less toys, so, you know, or a few less games or something like that. Uh, so, you know, it, it could be something that you know, maybe that's part of the guidance there too, as well, being lower yep. for the course of this year. 
All right, well, we can move on to our final segment. That's Brett uh, answering a listener question on grayscale Bitcoin trust, symbol GBTC on the OTC. You want to take that one away, Brett? I will take it right away. Today. Good. Didn't forget about me this time. I'm going to keep bringing that up. I know. <laughs> it's, it's a triumph. It's a triumph yeah. for me. All right. Like Ryan said, we got a question about the 46% discount to NAV on the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, symbol GPTC, on the OTCQX, trading at 11.88 when a market cap of 8.2 billion. The trust was founded in 2013 as a private fund and it began to be publicly quoted in 2015. GPTC is a trust that holds Bitcoin. As it's underlying with the goal of giving investors exposure to Bitcoin, less the fees and expenses, of course. But as the current discount implies, it's failed at this goal. It even says in its perspective and all over its website, it's failed. They know they failed at this. So what do I mean by trading discount to NAV or NAV? I'll be calling it NAV. NAV stands for net asset value, which is the cumulative value of the underlying asset or the assets in this case, which is Bitcoin. On a per share basis, the trust holds 0. 0.00091 Bitcoin, or roughly $22.27, but it only trades at $11.88, and there's your 46% discount. So it's just the, uh, the market value divided by the uh, and now value, minus one, of course, so that's 46% or negative 46%. As of the market close on the February 21st, of course, it does fluctuate a lot because it is Bitcoin. Previously, GPTC has traded at a significant premium. So this is when the market value is above the NAV. And it only started to trade as a discount in early 2021 and has steadily increased this discount quite consistently over the past year and a half. As this is structured as a trust, there is no guarantee of redemption for uh, holders of the shares. And this makes it so that you all can't close the spread quite easily. As of right now, the price and therefore discount of uh, GPTC is purely based off the supply and demand of the product. And as other products now exist for Bitcoin exposure compared to 2013 when it was initially created, demand for the structured product like this has dramatically fallen. It makes sense when there's other products that the amount's going to just naturally fall. This is the same reason why I previously traded for a significant premium because the, simply there was no really other products in the market as, as it is directed at institutional investors who are trying to gain exposure to Bitcoin. They weren't familiar with the product or the product class. And of course, there's no other products in the market. So they were willing to pay a premium to the actual market value of Bitcoin. So there's your premium valuation. This is different compared to an ETF, which GPTC has the goal of converting to. An ETF allows for authorized participants like banks or market makers to purchase the ETF share on the open market and redeem it with the issuer for the underlying asset or the asset value. Depends on the exact structure of it. This is important because it allows the authorized participants to conduct an arbitrage trade if a significant discount occurs, like in this current case with GPTC. And there's, of course, fees considered with ETF. So normally, ETFs will trade within less than a percent of the actual NAV value, but sometimes it can be significantly less than that. So if you look at like heavily traded ETFs like the SPY in the US, it's very commonly like 0.1% or less because otherwise you'll have arbitrage traders instantly come in and it's just all automated and in a fraction of a second they will have created a new share and sold it off and effectively they're making free money whenever that happens which is why you'll commonly see this with ETFs. The sponsor of GPTC has tried to convert to an ETF in 2022. The sponsor is Grayscale which is a sponsor is more or less just an organization that promotes and brings in capital to the trust and responsible for the creation and redemption of the shares. In this case the, they are also the initial creator of the trust, but that's not always ca the case. Sponsors can move around. They can get sold the underlying uh, well, operations because they do uh, get fees in exchange for running the uh, trust structure. And in this case, it's actually quite significant. It's a 2% fee of the NAV. So that you're not paying 2% of the market. You're paying 2% of the NAV. And over time, you can see I'll put up a graph. Uh, they're... Bitcoin's holding have slowly decreased at, at that 2021 point. And this is due to them taking their fees over and over again. The switch to an ETF structure was blocked by the SEC because they believe there's no safeguards to protect against market manipulation. Grayscale has, expecting this to happen, and this was in June of 22, initiated a litigation against the SEC following the decision on the same day. The SEC has previously approved Bitcoin futures 
products, but not Bitcoin spot products. So this is a derivative and it is traded on the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And what Grayscale's perspective is, it's the same risks. They should be treated as the same product. The SEC cannot choose and select the products if it's the same ultimate product. In this case, what Grayscale's arguing is still Bitcoin, either if it's a derivative of Bitcoin, so a future, or if it's the spot which is physical in this sense, even though it is a digital currency, of course. And they're arguing it's the same thing. However, the SEC argues it is quite different. Uh, because it is uh, ran through the Chicago and Mercantile Exchange and it's more regulated. It has a historic, I think it's 100 years or something like that behind it at this point. So it's quite regulated. I'd actually argue in this case in favor of Grayscale because the CME, they actually use uh, the benchmark. So this is how the futures are traded off of is derived from the same source, which Grayscale derives their pricing mechanism off of, which is external exchanges. So ultimately you're seeing the prices, which could be subject to manipulation, derive from the same source. So I don't really see the SEC's argument there. I, I would actually agree with Grayscale, which I, normally I'm quite critical of the cryptocurrency companies, but I'm not the SEC. And you have to await their initial decision, which they're expected to have oral arguments on March 7th, but then it can take about a month. And if Grayscale fails, they already said they're going to appeal it. So it could go on for quite a while longer. But if Grayscale is successful in the lawsuit, you'd likely see an immediate snap in the price up to that now value. So nearly a 100% increase for investors overnight because they know arbitrage is going to happen. And when arbitrage happens, it will go to that 1% or so within the value. But this would actually mean most likely a lower price in Bitcoin because they have a significant backing of Bitcoin, about 600,000. There's about 20 million uh, Bitcoin outstanding at this time. So what you're looking at a few percent. And if they arbitrage, let's say they completely arbitrage it out, 600 Bitcoin, 600,000 Bitcoin right onto the market, obviously would decrease the price. This would happen until an equilibrium price were to be reached. They would most likely be offloading in block shares when it wouldn't, it wouldn't impact it significant. I'm not talking like a hundred, like a 50% decrease. We've seen uh, Tesla, they offloaded about a hundred thousand Bitcoin or so. And it, it did make an impact on the price, but it was along with a ton of other stuff. So I'm not saying it's going to collapse the price if this were to happen, but it would most likely have a, at least short-term impact. But if Grace going were unsuccessful and most likely after their appeals and after all that, if they were still unsuccessful, they would, may do a tender offer for up to 20% outstanding shares, which it, more or less they go into the market and say, hey, we're going to pay X percent per share. So they might pay $22 right now and people are willing to sell the market. Obviously, if you can buy for 12 and sell for 22, you're immediately going to do that. So it takes some shares off the market. They previously actually had redemptions available way back in 2014, but the SEC deemed it violating financial regulations. And in 2016, they did a cease and desist. So more or less, there might be more legal troubles if they had an ongoing redemption program, but they are available to do a tender offer. But there are, of course, it's a complex legal situation, so we could see where that goes from there. As there are no redemptions possible, we've just been seeing selling in the open market as the Crypto market has effectively collapsed in uh, 2022. You've seen major, multiple large bankruptcies, some of whom who actually held GPTC. I think uh, Three Arrows Capital, uh, which was a hedge fund, uh, collapsed last May or so. They were actually doing a trade with uh, GPTC where they would buy it and then they'd short Bitcoin. I, I can't remember if they were just long. There's, there's a trade which has been talked about quite a bit. You'd buy GPTC, short Bitcoin, and hope the spread closes. But as the spread has grown and lots of these players are doing margin, it can collapse their funds quite easily. I, don't, I can't I don't remember the exact uh, function they were doing it, but they were holding GPT in some form. And as they need to sell off the GPTC to meet their liquidations, it makes the spread bigger and bigger. So that leads us to the 46%. Uh, recently, we've seen... Um, the parent company, the Grayscale, which holds obviously some of these funds, uh, DG, Digital Currency Group or DCGG, facing financial troubles after one of its subsidiaries, Genesis, is now facing bankruptcy. So they've been selling off some of their assets, which includes their own product ultimately. And this ultimately wouldn't affect the trust. It is held in a trust, so the underlying Bitcoin is secure. It's held actually with Coinbase. They only promote it and then they create the shares. So if, let's say, uh, DCG were to go completely bankrupt, you still have the trust. The sponsor most likely change. That asset would be sold off. But I have seen it online where people are like, oh, the 
this thing will collapse and they'll lose their coins. Assuming they're following what they're saying they're doing, which you never know with this space if they could be completely fabricated, but it's with Coinbase with another publicly regulated entity. That risk, I would say, is fairly low compared to many of the other players. But it's not the core reason why, which many people have been bringing that as, as the reason for discount, which is why I'm bringing it up. But in summary, GPTC has a discount due to only having really one way out, which is the open market. You have to sell, you can't redeem like many other structures like ETFs. And as the market demand has been lower and lower over the past year and a half, as well as just the product not being unique anymore, it's just increased the discount over and over. So there is obviously a trading opportunity. We're not traders. I'm not saying to go run out and do this trade, but it is obviously something which has been talked about, but it's actually hit hedge funds hard, just to give you an idea. It, it, the, this trade has already failed in the past. So I'll open up you guys if you guys have any comments. So you're saying that hedge funds have tried to make this trade and it yes. just keeps getting more and more of a discount. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. early 2021, um, the discount was zero, like it was equal to the NAV, and it's since fallen over the past year, this discount more and more. So if let's say you were like a 10x leverage, if there's that spread increases by 10%, which it's went up 46% or down 46%, depending on how you're looking at, it, that would obviously need liquidation or you need to add more funds in. And this is what was happening to some of these companies. I've seen this trade happen multiple times. And remember, if you're holding, in this case, you'd be long this grayscale fund, or grayscale trust, I should say, um, you're paying that 2% uh, fee as well. Mm -hmm. So your yeah. your funds will actually go down. You do have a bit of decay in there. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're ho if you're owning, you're hoping it becomes an ETF one. Exactly. Obviously hoping the price of Bitcoin can you know goes higher. Like yeah, it depends how you were to it. structure it. Yeah, if, if you're yeah. doing like the short Bitcoin long that, it doesn't matter what Bitcoin instead yes. of just matters on the spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, I think that will end us off for the week. Aaron, did you have anything further? Or Brennan, you guys are good. Get the nope. hell out of here. All right. I put them to sleep. Now, no. no. <laughs> keep, uh, keep your questions coming in to our Your Stock, Our Take segment. We'll keep answering questions there, whether they be on individual companies or individual other securities, or if you want us to compare a couple, rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, we'd like to see that on there. Uh, smash the subscribe button if you're looking on YouTube. And uh, as always, I'd like to wish you profitable investing and get those tickets, get those tickets for upcoming webinars as well as I remember that right at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>